noise than that. Hopefully when you came in tonight, you received an outline. It should say at the top of the page, receiving a double portion. Receiving a double portion. If you did not get one, if you'll hold your hand up, I bet somebody will run you one as quick as they can. Jay, we got any of them left? Amen. There you go. And we got some right here. Hey, Dalton, man, would you? Right there heading that way. Hey, we got a bunch of them. We got a bunch of them, Angie. We're good. I made some extras tonight. Y'all been, y'all been just growing in number on Wednesday night, so I thought I'd better run off some more. We've run out a couple of times. If you have your Bible, go ahead and find 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And you should have an outline that says receiving a double portion. If you were here with us on Sunday morning, you know that we, uh, we crept in again uh, really for the first time on Sunday morning with the church into 1 Kings 19. I've been, um, uh, y'all know about it, those of y'all that's been coming on Wednesday night, we've looked at uh, quite a few messages from 1 Kings 19. We're going to pick back up with our study of Romans once we kind of uh, probably spend a couple of more weeks in here. I want to, as we start talking more and more about vision, our direction, um, and we talked about on Sunday as a church, uh, there'll be some things we'll fill in a lot of the blanks. I, I talked in a very general way about it on Sunday over the next five weeks or so, maybe six. On Sunday mornings, we'll be getting a whole lot more down into uh, into the depths of it, so to speak. Lord's still continuing to to open good doors, and we're we're seeing good things about uh, lots of people. I, I I caught a lot of people on Sunday morning asking them did did things kind of click with them. Um, uh, from kind of across the spectrum, it looks like God is speaking to a lot of people in their lives, and uh, and that, of course, is something we're always you always want to look for. Whenever you you're sure that you got a word from God, one of the things you'll see is that God God the, the remnant God's people they'll they'll pick it up. Now, not everybody will pick it up, but the people that are that are really seeking with the Lord, they'll 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 start gleaning out of it into their life, and it'll start overflowing. Got a lot of stuff in this week about. Uh, with our evangelism efforts uh, uh, as we talk about uh, going forward that came in this week and it all looks it looks great I primarily talked about three things of a rhema a word from the word that God gave me about about uh, uh, our direction I talked a little bit about the cave that um, Elijah was in we've talked about that on some Wednesday nights and we we noticed that that he as soon as he believed God enough to begin to respond God gave him three things to do they were all to anoint uh, uh, to to set aside people for specific things one was a Syrian king uh, he wanted Elijah to go anoint a man named Haziel we saw on Sunday morning we looked in particular about how that was something that just wasn't done God, God's prophets didn't go around anointing outside kings we talked about uh, having an influence uh, in places as a church, we just don't have any, you wouldn't think we had any business having influence. We talked about Jehu. We talked about how that was the, going to be the new king of Israel, God's people, their community. There was going to be a change in that community. And we talked a lot about the school, uh, the direction God's continuing to open doors there. And that we, we thank God for that. But then we talked about the fact that God sent Elijah to go out and anoint Elisha and Elisha was going to be the prophet that took Elijah's place that was that was that was that was God's man within God's people um, and I talked to you a lot on Sunday morning I'm not going to re-preach the message you can get it from brother David and them back there if you don't have it already uh, about uh, about a, uh, a reality of a doubling within God's people and applying it specifically to us here at victory and I talked a lot about how I know God has, has laid it into my heart to pour in to people that are, that are definitely going to be a doubling. They're going to, they're going to take the seed of, of a lot of things that God's put into my life, and, they're going to, and, and, and I, I know that God's going to see, just like I'm the product of people that put seed into my life, I want to put it into your life in such a way that you become a whole lot more than me. It's a weak father that doesn't want his son or his daughter to be more than they are. It's a weak mother uh, that, that uh, loves their kids but don't want them to excel themselves. You know, that's the, that's the heart of a hater. 
a hater of somebody that's not content with their own life, don't want to see anybody doing better than them, right? And uh, we don't want, we, of course, we don't want that in the church. We don't want that in our families. We don't want that in our own life. We want to be those type of people that build up. And we saw that God sent Elijah out to do that. And if you know your Bible, you know that by the time you get to 2 Kings, and right there on the top of the page, though we're looking in 1 Kings tonight, I, I got this there in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. Elijah went and anointed Elisha, and Elisha went with him. We're going to talk about that in detail tonight. But if you'll notice, remember Elijah never died. Elijah was translated straight to heaven. Bible quiz, real quick. Who's the other person in Scripture we know of that that happened with? Enoch. Enoch, Genesis chapter 5. Enoch and Elijah, the two that we know of, some people go, well, they're the only people that never died. No, 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 we don't know that. We only know those two people God ever told us about. I don't know what all God's done. We'll, leave, we'll let God be the master of things he's done. But we do know about Enoch and Elijah. And, of course, they're a picture. Uh, hey, Betty girl. And uh, uh, they are a picture of those of us alive right now. Because if the Lord comes back, we're not going to die. The Bible says we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And this is what happened in Elijah's life. God called him forward. God let him know he was going to carry him forward. He even let Elisha know that he was going to translate him. And that's what you see happening in 2 Kings 2.9. If you look there on your outline or there on the scripture, I imagine David's got it up by now. And so it was that when they crossed over that, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I may do for you before I'm taken away from you. Elisha said, Please let a double portion, look at somebody and say a double portion. A double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. In other words, he said, if you see me go, it'll, that's, what, that's what you're going to get. Then, as it happened, as they continued on and, and talked, that suddenly... A chariot of fire appeared with horses and fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And then, of course, look at verse 12. And Elisha saw it. And Elisha saw it. And that we know from right there. And then, of course, you see it play out in Elisha's life that a double portion of the spirit of ability and prophecy and power that Elijah had, had on his life, and Elijah had great power in his life. Amen? Right? If you know your Bible, you, you can say amen to that. And Elisha became more. The student became more than the teacher. The next generation became stronger than the one that was before it. It's the heart we have for all of our kids and our grandkids. It's the heart that every old person in church has for the new coming generation we get these kids up here singing in those songs. We want them all to excel us. Amen. We want them to be great in power, ability, prayer, holiness, conviction. We want them to be soul winners, solid members of community, strong families. Amen. Praise God that they'd be twice what we become. Now, the reality is, is within all of us that are saved, there is a desire for that same type of ability. I want to be strong that I can make others stronger. But I'm not going to deny the fact that in Christ I want to be strong. I want to live a life of consequence. I want my life to matter. Amen. I'd be lying if I said anything else. Not foolish ambition, not prideful ambition. But if God has saved us for great things, then I want in on those great things. How do you get to the point to where you become one of the people that God's willing to put a doubling on? That's what we're going to think about tonight. Receiving a double portion. There in the middle of your outline, where did the doubling begin? First time we've heard about Elisha is when God tells Elijah to go anoint him. And we see in verse 19 that Elijah goes out to do what God called him to do. And the first place he went, and that's why as we talk about in our church, we know the first thing we got to see here is a doubling. If we don't have a doubling in spirit and power and number and salvation, holiness, conviction, y'all following me? Right? Growth, maturity, fellowship, 
we will never have a school that helps transform a community. We will never have an influence out in places far beyond what a little church in Scurry, Texas ought to have. Make sense? The Bible says if judgment begins, let it begin at the house of God. And so we have to put ourselves in that position. Now, as soon as he begins, to, he starts telling us about Elisha, by, in verse 19, he departs from the cave. And by the time we get through verse 21, we see that Elisha is with Elijah. There are some things that happen in this story that let us see some things that were in Elisha in seed form. The things God knew about before anybody else knew about them. And those are the things that God used and developed and ultimately put a double portion of his power and ability on him. So where does the doubling begin? Make sense? That's where I'm thinking about as we read verses 19 to 21. So he, that's Elijah, departed from there, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. He was with the 12. Now, he wasn't running a plow that was being pulled by 12 oxen. There were, there were 12 plows in the ground, okay? And he was with the 12th. He was with the one coming along behind, Okay? It says he was doing it, so he probably was in charge of it. But he himself was also busy at it. He was with the twelfth, and Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Mantle, the, the covering that Elijah used. Remember, we, we ran into this before where Elijah put his mantle up over his head when God called him to come up out of the cave, right? Here he throws it on Elijah. If you knew what was happening there in 2 Kings, you remember when they came to the river, Elijah took his mantle and smote the water with it, and they walked across on dry land. It was the picture of his prophetic office. He takes his mantle, and he throws it on Elisha. The picture is what? This is about to be your office, okay? He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? Elijah plays it very coy. So Elisha turns back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's, oxen's equipment, uh, probably that twelfth one because that was the one he was using, and gave it to the people and they ate. And then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. And you say, well, Brother Todd, is there really things here? Oh, yeah. You look into this story and you'll see some things about Elisha and if you compare them to other people we see in Scripture, we see that they are the type of people God uses. So, I'll draw your attention to six things that I noticed. There on your outline, let's just jump into it. Number one, you'll notice Elijah was, Elisha rather, was busy. Elisha was working. Elisha was doing something. And this is a good word for all of us that call ourselves Christians. Lots of times we believe God has a thing for us. God has a calling on us. And we want to sit back and do nothing until, well, God completes his calling. That ain't the type of people God uses. God uses people that will do what they can until he grows up in them the, uh, the full measure of their ministry. There's a many a preacher gets called to preach and goes and sits on a pew and then he's mad at God and everybody else 10 years later because nothing ever happened in his ministry, but he never did anything. I used to have so many young preachers mad at me. Brother Todd, you don't let me preach because God called me to be the pastor of this church. This church expects me to preach. If God wants you doing the preaching here, he'll move me, put you in. And then I'll have to figure out something to do. Mad at your preacher because he won't give you a spot. No, no, there's all kinds of spots. There's spots over there at Malcolm X and uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. over there in Dallas. There's, there's Washington Square up here at the courthouse. There's down out there in front of Sloan. 
Ian Frazier, brother Ian Frazier, you know, works with Glowing Heart and all now, you know, one of our college kids. Ian and them used to sit out there in front of Sloan's and, and, and pass out drinks and, and play the guitar and tell anybody to stop by about Jesus. He said, well, oh, hold on. Oh, oh, you got to, you only pre." I had one guy tell me he wanted to preach one time, but he, uh, but he wanted to preach on two Sunday mornings. Would have been his second and third sermon. I said, brother, you think for one minute, as much as I love you, I'm going to put you up in front of 500 people when I don't even know if you believe Jesus is God or not? I don't know you, and I'm responsible for that pulpit. Well, well, the thing is, is God uses people that are busy. Think about it. Moses was doing what when God showed up? Sitting at the house playing PlayStation? No, he was taking care of his daddy-in-law's sheep. What was David doing when God called him? He was tending his daddy's sheep. My Lord, even King Saul was out looking for a donkey when God called him. Think about it. Peter, John, James, Andrew were fishermen. Nathaniel was obviously devout in prayer. For he had, he had been doing the work of, of, of ministry, the work of prayer, when, when God revealed himself to him and then Jesus told him about it a day or two later, remember? Think about it. The, 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 the apostle Paul, when he was Saul, when God called and saved him, he was at least busy for the devil. See it? God uses doers. Are you really interested in any vision Brother Todd has about the future if Brother Todd has not hit a lick in 26 years? I wouldn't be. I'm not going to listen to somebody tell me about servants never serve. I'm not going to listen to somebody tells me about the importance of souls. I ain't never told anybody about Jesus. I'm not going to tell anybody that people need to be cared for, that ain't never been to a hospital, never, never, ain't got time to do funerals. I know pastors that pastor churches less than 200 people, but their schedule's too busy for them to do funerals. I'm sorry, how many did you say you pastored? Oh, 200. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you said 2,500. I could see you missing a funeral or two. You see what I'm saying? We, God uses people that are busy. Secondly, Elijah's just out there plowing, guys, in a, in a little place called Abel Mehola. I can't even pronounce it. It's so unknown. But that's where he was. We see that Elisha was hidden. He was busy, but he was hidden. If you don't know this principle about living, ministering, and growing in Christ, you write it down somewhere on your outline. You have to hide yourself before you can show yourself. God will hide you before he shows you. Jesus Christ himself hid himself in obscurity in a little town, not much bigger, in fact, much smaller than Kaufman, called Nazareth, for 30 years before he showed himself for th about three, three and a half. John the Baptist was hidden for 30 years for six months' worth of ministry. King David was hidden as the most least res respected. And when the prophet called, told Jesse, bring your sons before him, his own daddy thought so little of him, he didn't even invite him to the meeting. But that's where God knew he had somebody who loved him. Because David was willing to love on God and worship God when there wasn't nobody could hear it except his daddy that didn't have much regard for him. Sheep were the only ones that could hear what he was doing. I have said this before about my own life. It wasn't anything I did on purpose. It wasn't even anything I understood at the time. But one of the things I know when I look back and I think about the different blessings I've seen in ministry the, the praise God, the thousands of people I've got to minister to, baptize, do funerals for, and all of those kinds of things, is when God called me to preach, I was totally content to be hidden in a tool shed. Because that's where I started. I had a Bible, a Sunday school book about the book of Titus that was about written about 1945. 
and the concordance in the back of my Bible. And I was as happy as the day is long back there taking some advice that a preacher gave me, which was this. When he heard I'd surrendered to preach, he wrote me a letter and said, Todd, I'm glad God's called you to preach. My advice to you is this. Study, study, study. And when you get tired of studying, study some more. That was the end of the letter. That was all he told me. And I was content in it. I was happy in it. And I'll be honest, I've never had to go out and look for a place. If you are happy being hidden, but if you've got to be shown too early, that's pride. And God will not bless pride. In fact, there is no sin that God judges quicker than pride. You say, Brother Todd, I want to be used in this church. Be willing to be hidden. Gary Van was made a trustee in this church because he was willing to clean up every mess that we could make. How many toilet paper rolls did that brother change? How many times did we sweep and mop the bathroom floors and Gary would come in and think it not sufficient? Not say anything about it. Just grab another mop and another bucket of bleach and over it and over it he goes. I told him one day he was in there mopping down there at that middle school in that, in that, in that bathroom. And I mean, he was just a mopping and it's 9 o'clock at night. And I told him, I said, Gary Van, if there's one airplane I want to ride on, it's the one you work on. <laughs> My Lord, brother, you have, you, have, you have literally bleached the blue tile white. The floors is clean enough. Let's go home. What? Early? What? We'd start early in the morning putting together everything. Gary was the first one there. Who was the guy that got to bed? At, to his bed. Not in bed. To his bed on Sunday nights at 1030. Gary, last one. You got to be willing to be hidden. If you can serve in the little, if God wants you master of the much, he'll give it to you. But God does not, now don't get me wrong, you can advance yourself, and God gives us soul power, and you'll see a lot of people advance themselves. but I'm talking about people with the real anointing on their life. Dwayne Blue, who we've, of course, supported as a missionary for a long time, him and Iris are members here. Y'all pray for Blue. Blue got to get out of the hospital today. Had the other hip done, doing great, and uh, he, he said, man, I, he said, tell you the truth, Brother Todd, I feel so much better that the pain of this surgery ain't nothing like the pain I was in. So I'm just, you know, <laughs> I said, brother, you own painkillers. He said, even that. He said, he said, I'm telling you, I just feel so much better. But Dwayne, you know, Dwayne was just no outlaw, right? And he was scary. And Dwayne didn't know how to act around church. And here he's as big as he is, had a big old long beard, hair down to about right here. And he got to come into that church, you know. You know, he even came to the women's meetings because he didn't know what WMU meant. He, he Somebody said they'd have WMA at 5 o'clock, so he went. You know, he didn't know. At, at, and, you know, he couldn't read or write, okay? Of course, now he can read and write Greek and Hebrew. But you know who taught him? The custodian. Blue said, if this is where the blessing is, I'm just going to be here every day. They didn't invite him to come to work at the church. He just said, this is where I'm supposed to be. And so he just showed up every day. Well, they didn't know what to do with him. Could you imagine? You, can't, you don't know what to do with Blue now. And Blue, you're probably listening to this message online. But, you know, you don't know what to, Could you imagine then? Scare, had to scare the, the secretaries to death. You couldn't, you couldn't leave Blue in there in the, in the office. And, you know, I'm just sitting here waiting to bless Jesus. And he, he told the preacher, he said, wherever you go, I'm going to go. I'm going to be honest. That would have got on my nerves. I told him, look, you go with me for about two hours a week. Kids loved him to death. But what they did was they didn't know what else to do with him, and their custodian was a prayer warrior. And they knew he was a real spiritual guy. So what they did was they sloughed blue off on him. Here, you, you do take care of him. And he said, we would go through the church cleaning and doing, and the whole time we're ministering, he's teaching me. Well, guys, the reality is blue and iris are the longest serving volunteer missionaries in the North American to the North American Mission Board. Guys, I'm going to tell you, really, they don't go around talking about it. They know all the bigwigs. 
In fact, Iris and Dwayne know all the warts on the big league. They're, 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 they're the ones that a lot of these pastors that pastor 10,000 people. I've seen Iris check them. And I've seen them confess things to Iris that they wouldn't confess to their own wife. I mean, they, they, all the, all the quote-unquote heroes, they all know Dwayne and Iris. It got started in a, in a janitor's closet. Jim Everidge was saved in a foxhole in Vietnam, realized God had a calling on his life. The only people around him were other Marines. He didn't say, well, I'm going to quit this, and I need to go to six years of school, and then I'm going to come out, and they'll make me a major in the chaplain corps. He just started ministering to Marines right there where he was. Before he was in out of the Marine Corps, he was doing youth work out there in California where he was stationed just because he was going to church. Brother, G, Brother Jim's pastor churches run thousands of people. Guys, his first church was, was in Canyon, Tia, Texas. Harold, Harold Dudley, Carol Dudley's mom and daddy-in-law, okay, they went to that church. That's how he found out about coming up here. They, well, you know, they helped him, and he'd come up here to go to school. He was always too busy. He never got to go to school. Come to Robinwood, and the place blew up. That's what happened with Art. Art Treherne come to, he can't move down here from, from uh, Colorado to go to Southwestern and got there at Saxe before Brother Jim went there, and the church got so busy and blew up. Jim, Art ain't never had time to go get no, no degree, but he, he sings okay, don't he? Plays the guitar pretty good, don't he? Have a, have a surgery. You have to be at the hospital at 4.30 in the morning. And there he sits. Him and the janitor opening the place up. I'm like, Art, you got a key to this place? I'll see some people, you know, every now and then I'm like, I'm going to beat him. And I'll get somewhere, you know, 5.30. And they'll go, well, Brother Art was here about 30 minutes ago. I'm like, cotton picking. And they're like, what's wrong, Brother Todd? I said, I'm just tired of it. I'm going to need them glasses, guys. Oh, there they are. When you throw your glasses, you ain't got nothing else to look at. Buck 50, Dollar General. Whoa. Maybe careful is a good word. But you, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's the willingness to be hidden. You know, Victory Church, as long as we're happy, just loving Jesus where we're at, God will do great things in us. God will help us. they pretty straight. Are they? David, you, you be honest with me. Are these pretty straight? I don't know. Everybody else in here, oh, yeah, brother, Todd, they look great. You know? I know my man Dave won't do me wrong. Number three, and this one kind of has three parts. But Elisha was open. Elisha was open. Open to what? Well, you notice he was open to the cost. Because Elisha, it would appear here, is in charge of this situation. And I ain't never plowed no fields where they use 12 yokes of oxen. But I would seem, that would seem like a pretty big deal. He's overseeing a pretty big deal. He's in the 12th. He's, he's watching. He's behind it. He's making sure everything's happening, everything is occurring. So he was open to the cost. Life went, if not from easy, from comfortable, doable, to very hard. Elisha, Elijah rather, has been running for his life. The next thing he does is comes and gets Elisha. Elisha is there, looks like he, if nothing else, he's in charge of a pretty big situation. For all I know, his daddy was, owned it all. He was, he was in a, at least a comfortable situation in life. He could go through life. He had, a, he had a good job. Things were going good. Nice little country living. And, but he was willing to leave it. In fact, he left it all very quickly. He was willing, he was open rather, 
to the cost. Leonard Ravenhill used to, used to joke with people about how everybody wants to be so spiritual, and, you know. And, 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 and Ravenhill, especially as he got older, was known as quite a prophet. I mean, David Gilmer used to go down to his house to pray with him. So, I mean, he, he, wasn't, no, he wasn't no joke. But he said, he said, twice a year I get a letter from somebody telling me that God's told them they're the next John the Baptist. And he would write back to them, make sure you have your life insurance paid up. Because John the Baptist only ministered six months and got his head cut off. So welcome to the club. Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't mean it like that. We want, we want the crown without the cross. We want the attention, y'all following me, without the payment. I'm going to tell every one of y'all, you here on Wednesday night, I'm assuming you want a little more. You want to be part. If God really lights us a fire, let's say, I mean, if we become what we've never even dreamed of becoming, it will cost. It'll cost you your comfort. It'll cost you your schedule. It'll cost you your treasure. It'll cost you your, your energy. I don't know how many people I've seen and come across in life, they, they want to do great things for God, but, but I can't do Saturdays because Saturday's family time. Uh, Brother Todd, we want to do great things for God, but Sunday nights really don't fit into our schedule. When you want to have a, you know, a meeting at 4 o'clock, we got ball games. Here's the thing, baby. God loves you, and the reality is if you love him back at all, you, you'll get blessings out of that, but you ain't never going to be core. You ain't never going to be dependent on. You're never going to walk in a double anointing. You're not going to have discernment. You're not going to see extraordinary things done as it comes out of your prayer life. You can live a comfortable little life. Go to a nice little church. Y'all following me? But you are never going to walk in the depths. You're never going to see Satan run. You're not going to see strongholds fold. You're not going to see that it, whatever it is, on your kids and your grandkids because you're not open to the cost Jesus said if you don't pick up your cross and follow me when daily you are not worthy of me a cross is not the emblem of Christianity. It is an instrument of suffering and death. The early church, to the early church, the cross was not their emblem. If they had any emblem at all, it was what? It was a what? It was a fish. If there was any emblem at all, right? We're fishers of men, right? They did it a lot because so many things were undercover. Winky would come along down the wall, and though we probably shouldn't use graffiti, but he would kind of just mark a little arch. And it's just an inconspicuous little mark. If I was a believer in that town, I'd come along and put an arch on the other side of it. That Christian fish that you see on the back of people's cars when they cut you off in, uh, on Central Expressway and then shoot you the finger like you did something wrong? Yeah, that, that's, that's what that fish is. It means I'm a follower of Jesus, except when you cut me off in traffic. Remember, if you got anything religious about Jesus on the back of your car, then you are held to a higher standard. That's why we don't do bumper stickers here at Victory. I've just seen too many of y'all's cars at the, at the neon cowboy and the whatever that I just, I sure at least don't want no Victory Church discover the difference on the back of your car. Ask Brother Jim what happened when they had some Robin Hood stickers. Not Robin Hood, Robin Wood stickers. Or other than that, ask the guy that was in the beer hall when Brother Jim, out on visitation, scraped it off the back of his bumper with his pocket knife 
and brought it into the uh, grab them and stab them or whatever they was in. What was that bar, David? <laughs> David said, hey, I got a buddy that was there on that trip. But anyway, the, the cross was an, to an early century believer was nothing but a, a symbol of suffering and death. I'm not going to rah-rah you somewhere that the Lord said, come pick up a cross. I'm going to tell you this. I wouldn't do anything else with my life. If I had a thousand lives to live, I'm telling you this is the honest to God truth. I'd marry the same woman, I'd pastor the same church, and I'd minister unto the Lord. But there's a call. There's a call. My hair turned, started turning gray way too early. I put three funerals together. I am sick, physically sick, for two weeks. I've got faces and moments in my life that, frankly, I could do without. I baptized probably myself between 2,000 and 2,500 people, and I've done almost half that many funerals. I have had friend after friend. We're going with the Lord, only to feel a knife in my back six months later. I've lost some of my best friends to pride, confusion. I have people in this county like me, and I have people in this county hate my guts. My wife has done without finer things for just about all her adult life. Misty run around with no car, with two kids at home, for more years than I care to recount while we drove around in a used tempo on four used tires because there were things going on at the church that needed doing. That woman went bankrupt when we started this church. She had vacation for 22, 23 years. There is a cost. I'm going to tell you, Victory, if this, is, this is the reason why you just don't see it happen much in people's lives, and you sure don't see it happen in a church. Because I'm going to tell you, let me give you a typical Baptist church. Typical Baptist church, between 10 and 20% of the church really want to see something happen for Jesus. And 80% of the church wants, is there to make sure somebody looks after them, takes care of them, and does what they want. While they sit down and don't hit a cotton-picking lick, but go home and gripe and complain about every other thing that happens at the church. Brother Don McFarland, great old pastor, pastored up there in Garland and around. And Brother Don used to say this. He was a retired pastor. You know, retired pastors, they got no line. That's my Brother Jim loves being our staff evangelist. There's no limit, right? As long as I don't get on to him, he's had an easy day, right? You know? And I know Jim ain't going to tell you nothing other than what the truth is, so I don't give a rip. If Jim gets on you, you had it coming. Okay? When I asked Jim, Jim, we were talking about doing this, he said, I don't have to do no business stuff, right? <laughs> you ain't got to do business meeting one. Hey, Amen, I'm in. You know, it is. Praise the Jesus. Right? Right? What was I talking about? Brother Don McFarland. So Brother Don, he comes up, he's preaching one day for me. And he said, you know, ministry is like 
us all trying to get a, a wagon up a hill. He said, now, we need people that will push. Some people, they're just born pushers. They're good at pushing. And we need people that will push on the wagon. Now, some of us, we're better pullers. And so if you're a pusher, push. And if you're a puller, pull. And he said, and some of you, in fact, a lot of you, you want to ride. And he said, I'm going to tell you, we don't mind you riding if you just wouldn't drag your feet. <laughs> That's a good one, ain't it, Brother Heath? I, we don't care if you, you know, but most, most, most Christians, we want to see great things happen. But it's like, we'll, we'll do an Easter and they expect it to happen. Or we'll do a, a, a Christmas Eve or something, or we'll have a prayer time. 40 days of prayer. And people will go, our church is praying for 40 days. Well, when do you pray? Oh, I'm not. Our church is. They expect people to be, they know it's got to come through prayer. And as long as Angie Johnstone is praying, then amen. Like I say, I come from a praying church. Listen, you ain't in a praying church unless you're part of that praying church. And prayer is work. That's why the devil, if he's after one thing, he's after your prayer life. You know it as well as I do. Because if he can get you to quit praying, he can get the power out of your life. And the devil don't give a rip if you're doing something for Jesus as long as you ain't praying about it. There is a cost. If we could ever hit a point where 80% of the church was willing to, to pay the cost, and 20% just going to ride. Think about it. But most church is like a, going to an NFL football game. 22 people on the field running around desperately in need of rest. 22,000 people in the stands desperately in need of exercise. <laughs> but when the Cowboys beat the Giants the other night, I said, we won. I said, we beat the Giants. While I sat in my chair, I did, last Sunday night. I got in from Bible reading. I sat in my chair, and I watched Dez Bryant just, Dez, come on, man. Catch the ball. Push that guy off. No Dez out there. This guy's fast, you know, but old Todd, I'm sitting there drinking some tea and eating a pimento cheese sandwich. Are y'all following me? Guys, there is a cost. Count this. How many people in victory that you know, if you've been around here for a while, got in, got going, worked hard, quit? I love them, but that cost, that cost got them. See, you get your mind off things. I don't know how many people I've had say, well, I'm quitting this because nobody helps. Y'all have heard me talk about this before. Not a person that I've ever heard sign up for church ministry ever said at the start, I'll do this as long as somebody helps. They all come to me saying, Jesus wants me to do blank. Jesus wants me to do this. So you know what, guys? When did God change his mind? God wanted you to work with kids. Maybe God knew nobody was going to help, and that's why he sent you. If you got it, say, I got it. Secondly, he was open to the calling. Elijah comes by. Now, everybody knew who Elijah was. They feared when Elijah showed up. Elijah come walking into town. People want to know, are you here for peace? Or are, you here for, or are you here for trouble? Elijah comes by and he throws his mantle on Elisha. And you can tell it was a... And Elisha jumps up and says, can I, go, can I go kiss my mom and daddy by first? Look at what look at how he says. Well, you go back again for what have I done to you? You don't catch what's going on, Elisha? I ain't going to explain it to you. Let me tell you something about the opportunities of God. Sometimes they'll just come about on a Wednesday night. And God will stir your heart about something. You go, you know, I need to do that. But then you go home, put you on TV dinner, eat it away. Three or four months later, maybe you're sitting in church, all of a sudden, you know, maybe I ought to. Then you... You've got to be sensitive. A lot of times, people say, I just don't see God. God, God moves in a lot of glimpses. And, and when you step 
what had happened with Elijah, think about it. He's in the cave. God speaks to him. The only thing Elijah did was move to the door. When he moved to the door, God showed him what he wanted him to do. But he didn't tell Elijah while he was laying back there in the cave, come on, baby. Now, I need you to get up because here's what I, I got. I need you to go over here and get Elisha, and then I'm going to get you to get Haziel and Jay. And I'm going to tell you what else, uh, Elijah. All the people you think are out to kill you, guess what? If you'll go out now, baby, now listen to me. Don't turn me off. If you'll go out and do what I'm telling you to do, the boys, I'm going to have you invest in their life. They're going to take care of your problem. Mm -mm. He said, come outside and he heard God's voice and he stepped and when he stepped God gave him more Elisha's call is a brother walking by throwing a cloth on him and he said well, let me go kiss my mom and daddy well you do whatever you want to because what have I done to you it was that quick God's calling you to get saved I got news for you baby that call is sufficient you don't need nothing else. Say, well, if I just saw more, God would not be any more real. If Jesus showed up right here bodily, then he is the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart right now. Because the Holy Spirit ain't a it. It's not an impersonal thing. The Holy Spirit's as much God as Jesus is. And if he's stirring you, it's already the loudest voice you've never heard. You know exactly what God Almighty wants. The one that named the stars and threw them all into being and holds together the very atoms of your creation. You know who it is. What else do you need to know? He said, well, if I just understood more, if you'll take the step, if you'll follow him in life, what God will do is as you move in faith, he will give you more. Now, will you ever fully understand everything, every twist, turn, everything that's happened in your life? No. And if you, if you get on to God about it, he'll say, my ways are higher than your ways. And you say, well, I don't like this. And he might say to you like he did Job. And Job was his boy. Well, where was you when I did all this? Mr. Understanding. Remember how he told Job? He said, you're going to listen and then you're going to answer me. And God broke him down there for a minute. And Job said, oh, I've been foolish. I can't give an answer. God said, no, I said, you're going to give an answer. And again, that was with Job. Remember, Job said what? These are the edges of his ways. Our God is so deep, so broad. Guys, he's a good God. I know there's a lot of things in life we don't understand. Lots of turns, things happen we don't, we don't follow. Me and Danny, Monday, went, went to go fishing. Of course, we didn't catch nothing. Danny's a terrible fisherman. But, uh, but we, we come up on a boat wreck. And... Tried to save an old boy and wasn't able to do it. It was just a terrible thing. And with the whole time, one thing, because if you, I ain't going to give you all the details, but it was like, it was almost like God just let us be there for that one moment. But what was going to happen was happening. We, we both said, man, you know, we thought about it 10,000 times since. Is there anything else we could have done? No. It's just God had it in that moment. Now, I don't know why, but I do know that God is going to work out his purpose and his plan. Troy asked me, he said, he said you are, I said, Bub, I'm glad it was, it was us and not anybody else on this planet. No, nothing else, we was there to pray over. You see, you, and you just, well, why did this happen? We just two guys out chasing sand bass saw an ice chest. And I thought, well, that don't look right. Danny said, there's going to be a boat around here somewhere. And well, praise God, we found it and found him, and he had comfort before he passed. So you don't know. And I don't know all that. And I, I've had 10,000 things like that in life. But, guys, we know that our, that our God is, is good, and we know he's real, and he's worth following. He was open to the calling. Thirdly, he was open to the change. And that's not just cost. That's change. We, we, we think there's safety in things being the same. But safety is where the Lord is. And the Lord likes to do a new thing. 
listen to me, if you're over 35. God likes to do a new thing. Behold, I do a new thing. God will do a new thing. He keeps it interesting. He is original. God don't do nothing the same way anyway. Right? God, lo God loves to do things differently, and God wants to expand us. If you can embrace the changes that God brings into your life, I'm going to tell you something. It's like the fountain of youth. How old is David Gilmer? Don't tell me he's past 40. Don't tell me he's past 40. His birth certificate says something else. <laughs> His birth certificate written in Roman numerals. But that, that's, got nothing, that's got nothing to do with what we're talking about here. That was, that was terrible, wasn't it? That was terrible. I just thought that up. Come off the top of my head. Anyway. But, but if you think about it, oh, oh Dave, he's, he's contemporary, isn't he? He's contemporary with whoever he's ministering to and with, right? You've seen it. You've seen it. What is David always working on? New thing. A new stirring. Working at it. Embraces it. Sees where God's moving. You know, once a wave is broken, it's come up on the shore. Let's look for another wave. Right? Not, well, we're here. That was fun. Went surfing once. Now, if you're a surfer, you want to catch waves. Church has to be that way. We have to be that way. Embrace, be willing, and be open to the change that God left. He, God changed you from being a farmer to a prophet. I've always said that one of the reasons the Lord gave me the fire department was to see if I'd leave it. Because I took it to get a job. I figured if anybody was dumb enough to pay me to work one out of every three days, I was going to cash that check. Everybody's like, I've been wanting to be a fireman my whole life. I said, I want to be a fireman as soon as I heard they work one day and they're off two. And they got good insurance. That was, that's when I wanted to be a fireman. But I fell in love with it once I was doing it. But I've always said one of the reasons I think God gave it to us, lots of different reasons, but, but, but part of it was, would I be open to a change? The, to throw off the security. We had a guy in our church when I left the fire department. He said, he said, Todd don't need to leave his retirement. I remember my grandpa telling him, Todd don't leave it. He may not have a retirement. He may not live to see a retirement. And the reality is I want to go where God's moving. Amen? I was in a great church when we, when we at, at, at Cottage High School when God sent us out. I had to be, if I hadn't been open to the change, we wouldn't be standing here now. And I love Cottage High School, but I'm going to be honest. I love the freedom that we have here and the worship we have here, and the things that I, I learned being out that year that we, that we all take for granted here, I love them more. I love that time. But that was a time preparing us for this time. You've got to be willing to a change. A change is not a bad thing. Come on, empty nesters. I know it ain't easy when that last little baby leaves the house. But you got, yeah. But you, now you got time. Misty and I, one day, we was driving around, going to get something to eat. On the, I said, baby, what did we do every Thursday night? One day, I was driving down to the lake. We were going to buy Trinidad, going to Trinidad, and I thought, why does this seem so familiar? Misty said, because we drove here every Saturday all summer long for five years straight. Ball game. I was, I was so glad when my kids got in junior high. No more peewee practice. Let the coaches do them at practice. I go to the game, get to be the dad. I'm always right. You know, before that, I was the coach. Everybody's mama mad at me. Now they're mad at the paid professionals. I stand on the fence. Somebody goes, that coach is sorry. I go, yeah. That was a dumb call. Yeah. Life got easy. It's not, it's, it, it, it's just you got to, but if you don't embrace the change, you can't treat your 30-year-old son like he's three and expect to have great relationship with him. But it, Misty and I will tell you, we enjoy our adult kids as much or more than we did our little kids. Just, it's just a different time. A change is not bad. And if, it's, if it's going the wrong way, it's a bad choice. But if, it, if it's going good, it's okay. 
I, I just glanced down at Dalton. Dalton surrendered to preach a while back. And of course, Dalton was preaching for Hillary, hooked up with her, so to speak, before they got started dating and marrying and all that. Okay. But I've seen guys like Dalton be married and young wife. God calls him. <clears throat> like he's all, oh, for whatever you want, Jesus, she back there going. And I'm going to tell you something, ma'am. You've got to have your surrender time. I had surrendered to preach. We went to church right after that. And Misty was crying her eyes out. And, of course, Mimi was there. And I said, you think Misty's okay? And she said, I think Misty just had her surrender moment. She's wise enough to recognize that I didn't. And I don't even know if that's the case, baby, but that's what we said. But ain't that right, baby? Misty, Misty told me I got my billfold wet when I jumped in the water the other day. And, uh, and I carry two letters that Misty wrote me. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, the woman writes me letters, it's like songs and poetry. But these are my two favorite ones. But I carry, I carry one in my pocket, and I don't have it right now. I'd read it to you. But it's in my office. But I've carried a note in my pocket that she wrote me on Pastor Appreciation Day in 1992. She typed it out. We had a, a dot matrix printer. You know, what I'm like, boy, it looks old timey. But anyway, and she typed it out, and she said, and wherever God takes you in ministry, I'll be there with you. And I tell, I tell a lot of guys, they're like, man, God did this for you, and you did, how did that happen so quick? I said, my wife. My wife. Any time I've been on the edge of being fearful, she's the one that says, did the Lord lead you to it? Because I've done some crazy stuff in ministry. <laughs> Amen, baby? I walked in the door and said, God's leading me away from Cottage Heights. She said, whatever God's leading you, but it better be God. <laughs> you know, it wasn't exactly like that, but it was something. It was, if God's really in it, fine. She's never given me one hiccup. I've seen guys, Brother Heath, you've seen it. Guys fight their wife through, you know, not that, it's just, it's never right. It's never right. Because we're not willing to, for the change. You know, when I married Misty, she, they was loaded. I mean, them rods was rich. And she, she, give, she said, baby, there ain't nothing. That, I, I'm rich when I'm with you. And I said, well, I'm glad you feel that way, baby. And then when I went in ministry, she really found out what it was. <laughs> Brother Heath's here. Brother Heath's pastor for years. was very successful in, at, at 8th Street, Grand Prairie especially. And uh, they had a beautiful house there. A bunch of people there in the church helped them build and, that they lived in. And... and uh, and I said, Brother Heath, I just, I love this. He said, well, the Lord will bring you through the, you know, the times. And he said, he said, I remember sitting down in a bathtub and looking into the drain. It just had a pipe, right? And there was a mouse in it. You told me that. And he said, I remember looking at that mouse thinking, well, this is ministry. Amen. Do what now? Said he caught 17 mice that night in Mousetrap. <laughs> Sister Heath, the saddest thing she's got going on in her life right now is that her health is so weak she can't be here with him. Because she's done nothing but support the pastoral ministry of Brother Heath for 65 years. See, when God brings us to to opportunity it always necessitates a change i think that's why peter asked him well lord what's going to be given to us that have given up everything because think about it they're in the fishing business they left it matthew guys think of the money matthew was making ain't nobody made money like them publicans and Matthew, Matthew left the receipt of custom. He got up from the table and followed Jesus. That man walked away from what would be equated now to a three or four hundred thousand dollar a year job. Jesus said, "Follow me." 
it, there's a change. You're going to have to find God faithful. You say, well, Brother Todd, that's fine. God ain't calling me into ministry. Is he calling you to tithe? Oh, tithing? Tithing will make a change. Well, Brother Todd, we ain't got money for tithing. Oh, you ain't got money spending the money the way you're spending it now. Amen. I got no, I got no problem. I don't doubt that. $200 a week and going out to eat? Dish TV? iPhone? Oh, I'll get down there with it. $800 a month truck payment? Guys, a Ford Dooley costs $65,000. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me wrong, Dave. I'd love to drive one of them King Ranches down the road, baby. Stack it up on some 35, drive around like a happy redneck. I ain't paying $65,000 for nothing. Ain't got a front porch on it. <laughs> but you say, Brother Todd, hold on a minute now. Now, hold on, you're getting close. I, I, guys, that's what I'm trying to do here. There's a cost if you recognize the calling. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bring a change. Now, nobody's ever given up anything for the name of Christ that he does not reward us in heaven and in this world. But I'm going to tell you something about it. I'm, let me be honest. Let me just speak as a disciple. God don't owe me a thing. He's already blessed me more than I deserve. God's been better to me than I'd have been to myself. So if, if he doesn't want to turn back and bless me because I tithe or give offerings, fine. Fine. God don't owe me a dime. But I will tell you this. I have been where we, didn't, we were glad to see $5 in the bank. Tithed and gave offerings. My goal every year is I try to give 20% a year to the Lord. Now, some years we'll hit that. Sometimes this and that happens. Well, I fluctuate between 15 and 22, 23. And you say, well, Brother Todd, you letting your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Only because I'm pastoring you. And only because I want you to know that I'm telling you, I, God's blessed me. It, there is, listen, I'm going to tell you something. If you will follow God's plan for giving, you will have money to give and money to save. The problem in it is we don't follow his plan for giving and living. Now, I'll tell you something else. If you'll watch, people that are givers, and we'll talk about this in just a second, are people that God blesses. Because if God wants you giving, he'll make sure you have a means to give. And God will raise you up. Javier, Roy, and them, them, you talk about two successful businessmen, they, they didn't start off that way. But those are generous brethren. I've seen them give to people. I've seen them pour out. I mean, brother, Javier used to run 1920 stone crews. I mean, come on. So I'm just telling you, that if, if you will follow God's plan, God will bless you. Okay, if you'll get down to, since I'm on that, let's just look at number four. Elisha was generous. Elisha killed them oxen and took that meat and went and sold it and had a, and, uh, and bought him a bass boat with his last little money. No, it says he took it and he gave it to the people. He was generous. God loves a cheerful giver, right? It says the Lord says that, right? Like the Lord says, he loves a cheerful giver. And you know what the Bible says? We're in the Gospels. Did you ever read that? Paul talks about it, but nowhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John is it quoted that Jesus said that. Brother Jamie Starks told me one time, he said, I think that's because that's a saying Jesus just went around saying. That was just something that everybody knew. Rick Warren used to say that the Lord loves a cheerful giver, but he'll also take from a grouch. <laughs> but, 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 but he was generous. He, we're talking about the type of people God, God doubles now. 
The Bible says, cast your bread upon the water, and it'll return after many days. So much of this universe runs on the principle of the seed time and harvest. You put in, you get more back. If you sow wickedness, you sow, you sow the wind, you get a whirlwind back, right? You, 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 you sow corn, you get corn back, and you get more corn. You, 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 reap, you reap in kind, and you reap in abundance. Does that make sense? What I mean by in kind. If I plant tomato seeds, I don't get okra. If you plant wickedness, you're, you can't do wrong and expect right to follow you. Oh, I tell you, as an old man, I have had it with, where's God? Where's God? I can't believe the Lord did this stuff. Well, one, are you even saved? Are you even, are you even one of God's people or are you one of the children of wickedness? I can't believe the Lord did this my marriage. You've been cussing your wife out for 10 years. Why are you amazed that she left you? God didn't do you foul. All that happened was is what you sowed has grown up. You treat your kids like dirt when they're little. They don't respect you when they're old. Duh! Your 16-year-old don't respect you. I don't know. Maybe it's because you lied to his mother. Maybe it's because any extra dime you've got you spend on yourself. Maybe you holler and cuss at him like he's a farm animal and he just puts up with it because really he don't know what else to do and he doesn't have anywhere else to live. We did the best we could with our kids. Really? Really? Let's go back and check that Sunday school record when that child was here at church 12 times a year. I've heard that so many times in my life. Well, it didn't work out for us. We raised our, our children up right. Uh, oh, yeah, really? Let's see. Y'all came to church when you felt like it and there wasn't nothing else better to do. You cheated. You've had two affairs over the last 15 years that your kids have went through. And you, you did everything right at home. Now, don't get me wrong. God himself put two in the garden, and he didn't do nothing wrong. And look how them two, what two, them two idiots did. But a whole lot of it, guys, is just getting back what we put in. The other thing is you reap in abundance. I put one grain of corn in the ground, I get a whole corn plant up. If it's got two or three years on it and there's four or five hundred kernels on every year, I put in one, I got back 2,000. The principle... Does that make sense? The seed, time, and harvest. We put a little in, we're going to get more out, but we get out what we put in. Okay, five. Elisha was celebrating. Or you could also say Elisha was happy. Because I don't know about y'all, but that looks like a party to me. Again, maybe he was a good Baptist, and this is more of a fellowship. You know, we bad, but we can't have parties. I wonder half the world don't want to be Baptist. We can't even have a party. You ever notice that? You can't have a Sunday school party. You have to have a Sunday school fellowship. You've got to church it up. Party sounds like we're having a good time, and God knows that we Christians ain't supposed to have a good time. I don't know. I don't know where we got looking miserable with being devout. Amen. Jesus had a good time. If you'll read the scriptures, you'll see Jesus showed up at the party, heard they were selling alcohol, still went. He did. And when they ran out, he made them more. Look at how many times when you read your scriptures, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, watch how many times Jesus uses exaggeration. And exaggeration in Jesus' day was the essence of Hebrew humor. When Jesus busted them with, y'all strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, there was people in the back going, no, he didn't. Woo! I mean, that stuff was going on Twitter, Facebook, like now. Instagram. Look at Jesus busting down these Pharisees, and everybody, everybody out there is like, whoa, he's crazy. 
I mean, just lit him grow up. Look at how many times he did it. The Word of God says there's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry. If anybody's got any business being happy as Christians, lost people act more happy than we do. Now, don't get me wrong. If you've got to stick a needle in your arm or get rolling on the floor drunk to be happy, that's a problem. I done got him upset. Ain't that true? Kind of off so loud. Usually my voice puts him to sleep. But <laughs> he's like, Brother Todd, it's too long. Brother Todd, hurry up. But if, what was he celebrating? They were celebrating the fact that God called Elisha. I'll be honest, when God called me to preach, I went in the morning. I wasn't happy about it. I learned that God was not trying to curse me later. But I'm going to tell you, there was a while there I thought, God's, God, God is so tricky. I said, God's done got me. I said, Lord's done forgive me. And he's taking me to heaven. But it's like, all that nonsense you pulled, I'm about to get eat. You're going to go through hell on earth. And now I'm going to let you go to heaven, but that being backslid that five, six years, I got that. You, you're paying for that. And, I, and it's the way I felt. Was it wrong? Of course, because of my sin's under the blood of Christ. And I, God, God operates in grace. And what I thought was a curse was really nothing but a blessing. When God speaks to you, look, there are miserable people wishing God would say their name. I've seen people dying in the hospital wish God would call them to be saved. But they won't call. L.B. Harris tells a story of in his ministry going to see a man in the hospital who was lost. He said, I went to see him and I talked to him. He said he never stopped looking out of the window. He said he laid there looking out the window and I was talking to him and he said, he said he turned his head and he looked at him. And he said, Preacher, I can tell you this. It is a terrible thing to live and to die and go to hell. And L.B. said, Brother, if you, you feel that way, he said, there was a time in my life when God called, but he's not calling now. He said, I could say whatever you want me to say, but I know in my heart God's not talking to me. You say, Brother Todd, what happened? Two weeks later, he was dead. Only God knows what happened in eternity. If God's talking to you, that's a good thing. Listen, if God's calling you to save you tonight, he's not, caught try he's not trying to curse you. I know it feels heavy, but he's not, he's not cursing you. Listen, if God is speaking to you about an addiction in your life or a besetting sin in your life and, and, it, and it's miserable right now he's not doing that to make you miserable he's doing that to set you free he's trying to get you to act if God's calling you to service in this church or in what we call special service which is preaching and things like that guys he's not he's not trying to wreck you if God's trying to get you to work with the kids or be a greeter or, or work as, a, as a, a shepherd group leader or work in RV. He's not trying to ruin your life. He's not trying to steal your Tuesday night. He's trying to bring you to a blessing. Elisha got called. They were happy about it. Last thing, number six, verse 21, maybe big as of any of them. Elisha turned back from him, took the yoke of oxen, slaughtered them, boiled their flesh, using the oxen's equipment. He gave it to the people and they ate. Look. And then he arose and followed Elijah. Look. And became his servant. If Elisha was anything, he was humble. Now here's a man that had the mantle of Elijah cast upon him. Everybody knew the power Elijah had in the Lord. Elijah could stop the rain. Elijah could call down fire. They feared everywhere Elijah went because the, he, Elisha knew Elijah's untouchable. Ain't nothing going to happen to Elijah till God lets it happen to Elijah. 
Elijah don't walk in a room that God ain't already walked in there. But here, he's willing to become his servant. Look at 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 11. I put it there at the bottom of the page. Now that I look at it, I put it very small at the bottom of the page. This is later. Elisha's in heaven. Elijah's on the earth. And Jehoshaphat, now that's the king of Judah, is with the king of Israel. And him and another ally are going to go out to war. And Jehoshaphat wants to know, do we have a prophet to find out should we go out to war or not? Now, realize all the, the followers of the kings of Israel and such, they just a bunch of idol worshipers. They did as they thought best. But Elijah, Jehoshaphat said, hey, we got a prophet we could talk to? Is there no prophet of the Lord here that me, we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, because the king sure didn't cotton pick and well know, Elisha the son of Shaphat is here, look, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. How was Elisha known? He was known as Elijah's servant. Even after Elijah's gone and Elisha's walking in twice the power that Elijah walked in. Y'all following me? How was he known? He was known as a servant. He was known as a servant. Elisha was humble. Jesus said to his disciples one night, he said, you call me master and Lord, and you say well, for so I am. But I have washed your feet. He said, you call me the master and Lord. And guess what, boys? You're dead right. I am your master. And I am your Lord. But I've washed your feet. Tell you something about Christian leadership. You don't know it. Christian leadership is servant leadership. You lead by serving. If you don't serve, you'll never be in a position where you can lead. I've talked to a lot of young preachers, you know, and I've, I've gotten old, and I'm, I've gotten a little bit shorter worded. Sometimes I've been considered harsh. And the way I preach has always been authoritative and loud. And you have guys go out, and they'll go pastor a church, and they kick them out in about two months. And like, what happened? Well, you went out there and screamed at them and hollered at them, but you never loved them. I said, but Brother Todd, I saw you, yeah, but did you see me the night at Parkland Hospital that I laid on the floor with that man? Did you, did you, was you in the pickup truck with him driving around while he had a pistol in his hand? Have you sat in the fire ants? With a guy leaned up against the tire of his truck with a 357 in his hand who's telling you brother Todd if you don't leave me alone I'm going to shoot you and then shoot myself and I said well I'm not going anywhere and believe me them fire ants was t testing my resolve and sat there for an hour and cry with him and hurt with him I told him, I said, guys, until you've, you've held that woman while she's screaming over her dead baby, God gives you a doorway then to walk into people's lives. James Canada sponsors, does a lot of sponsor work. Angie does a lot of that with our RV. James, sometimes you say some pretty hard things to people. I know because they call me and tell on you. I wanted Angie to be my sponsor because Angie seems like the nicest person in this church, Brother Todd. But I'm, Angie just told me all my business. <laughs> Amen. But she loves you, doesn't she? Was she lying to you? Was he lying? No. 
But Brother Todd, I wanted you to take my side. I know, but I'm not going to. It's not always easy. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. But when you've been there, see, a lot of people want the limelight. But they don't want the phone call at 3 in the morning. We want the crown, but we don't want the cross. Say, Brother Todd, I want God to do something with me in my life. If that's a serious statement as a Christian that you're making, you fold that little sheet in half, you tuck that thing away in your Bible, and you ask yourself every now and again, am I busy? Am I willing to be hidden? Can I be unknown? Let me ask you something. Would it be okay with you if a real revival came to this church and you never got any credit for anything you did? I'm going to tell you something. God will use the person that don't care who gets the credit. And I'm going to tell you something about real strength anyway. Real strength, baby, ain't being the flower. Real strength ain't being the little bloom at the top of the tree. Real strength's being them roots. Real strength's being that trunk. I want to play with those so bad, but I, I better not. I was like, oh, something shiny. Y'all following me? Hey, the blossom's pretty, but the blossom's fragile. Leaves are pretty, but they're fragile. You ever notice somebody walk up to a big old oak tree and they do this? Oh, look how big that tree is. They never go, boy, I bet them roots run deep. Y'all following me? Where you want to be? I, man, I just want to be a worker. I just want to be a voice. John the Baptist said, they said, who are you? Are you the Messiah? He said, no. He said, you that prophet? He said, no. They said, well, who are you then? He said, I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, if you know your scriptures, you know he was quoting Isaiah 40. You know what he was saying? I'm just happy being what God wants me being. And I'm going to tell you something about that. Now, y'all, some of you, y'all younger folks, you listen to old Brother Todd. Because the Lord doesn't walk me around all that old pride. There is a lot in that being known and being successful. And, but I'm going to tell you when you get happy. I'm just being what God wants me being. I mean, you know when God broke me at it? when he just he really, really made me taste my own pride, was I was in an airplane one day, Winky, flying over this part of Kaufman County, flying over Rosser. Not quite as impressive as you'd think. Scurry and Kaufman. And I thought, well, look at these little old places. It looks terrible. And that dude needs to mow his yard. I mean, you know, you just... And I'm like, well, Lord, this is where you sent me. Because I know one thing. I got a burden for Kaufman County, the six counties around it. Kaufman County has been in me ever since I started. And the Lord said, yeah, but it's where I want you. I did, but you know what? The, yeah, I wanted the city. But you know what? One day the Lord taught me years later, just since I'm talking about it, is I drove up to Dallas one day out on the, on the 45 bridge coming in from the south and I thought well ain't that pathetic billions and billions of dollars to build that right there and it ain't but that big you know because I can see Dallas off from the stretch I said don't look nothing like what God's put all around it and the Lord said they're all little places to me baby all little places it's where we're at if you can get happy being what God wants you to be, you get content. 
when you get content, you're in peace. I don't have to be somebody I'm not. Let's pray. I'm going to end tonight with going back to if God's calling you, it's a good thing. Hello. I want to thank you for spending this time with us today. I hope there was something that happened during the, the message or maybe during the, some of the singing that you saw that, uh, that spoke to you in some way. You know, one of the great things that happens when we talk about God's Word is God starts talking to us. You know, the Word of God says, in fact, Jesus, the Son of God, said that unless the Father draws someone, they can't come. One of the great things is that the Spirit of God, working in harmony, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, He seeks us and He calls us and He draws us to Himself. You know, if you're listening to me right now and you are already a Christian, you know this has already happened in your life at one point or another. Maybe now you're, as you listen to the Word of God, you're, you're feeling Him talk to you. He's probably leading you towards some type of decision. I want to encourage you, if God's moving you, to, to accept a challenge or uh, to take a step of faith, to, to just listen for God and expect that He's going to uh, help you, that He loves you, and that you're one of His children. Sometimes, as He talks to us, it's not real comfortable. We have to remember that the Bible tells us that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And sometimes He does speak to us and lets us know there's a problem so that we see His Son as the solution and we kind of get back on track. If we can help you with that here at Victory Church, we'd love to. You can contact us uh, uh, through the website, uh, online, some way or another. I'm sure you can find a way. And, um, and we'd love to get to help you uh, uh, grow in your walk. Uh, perhaps, as you listen today, you've never really come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you're experiencing that call for the first time. Uh, the Bible says God's not the author of confusion. So if he's speaking to you, he's... He knows what he's talking about. He's, if you heard during the message, there was probably a time where I was talking about coming to faith or, or being saved, as the Bible calls it. It's where God calls us out of the darkness of our sin and the separation that's caused by our sin as we recognize and we come to believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He paid that price. He rose from the grave. He's alive, and he can give us life. And the Bible tells us that when we... When we come to a point of faith in that and we begin to speak to God about it, he enters into our life, he makes us his child, and he begins to make all kinds of, of great and wonderful promises to us. But there's two things that are absolutely essential, and that is that we believe uh, that Christ has died for us, that he's rose from, uh, for us, that he wants a life with us, and that our sin has us separated. You hear two big words when you read the Word of God. You hear belief and you hear repentance. We repent of sin means we turn from it, and we repent because we believe. We believe that Jesus Christ is our substitute for sin. He died on the cross in our place, and he rose from the grave. The Bible says to give us life. The way that begins to operate in our life is the Word of God says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the reality is, is that God calls us so that we make a choice towards him. And we show our belief in that choice by believing enough to pray. Real faith always has, uh, it always produces something. It produces a work. In this case, it produces us believing enough to act, to speak towards a God we've never seen. We've never seen with our physical eyes or heard with our physical ears, but yet we know and we believe that he's leading us out of darkness into light and he's, and he's speaking to us. We, it's, it's, it's the loudest voice we never hear so to speak loudest sound you'll never hear is the call of god into your life but it's real and if you understand if uh the things we talked about today in the message what i'm talking about right now if god's calling you then you know exactly what i'm talking about you need to come to that point of decision um and the way you do that is to pray now you don't need my help to do it you can right now just ask the lord to Forgive your sins. Tell him that you believe that he died for you on the cross. He rose from the grave. That, that you want to repent of sin, turn from sin, and turn to him. And somewhere in there, the Lord will meet you in that faith, and he will save you. The Bible says, for as many as have received him, and those that want to believe on him, the Bible says he, he calls those people his children. In fact, it says he gives them the power to be the children of God. If you say, Preacher, I don't really know what to say. 
In just a second, I'll lead you in a prayer where you could pray and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior, but I want you to really understand what I'm about to say, and I think you probably know this. You, you don't get saved because you repeat after a preacher. You've got to believe what you say to God. But if you do believe that he died for you, he rose from the grave to give you life, that you want to turn from sin, then just bow your head right there where you are and just say these words out loud while I say them along, but be talking to God. Just say something like this. Just say, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm lost, and I know I can't save myself. But with all my heart, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the grave, and you can give me life. I ask you to come into my life, to be my Lord. I'll try to follow you, to be my Savior, because I need you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Give me a new life in you that you tell me about in your word. And help me to begin to walk with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And just say amen. And if you're here, if you're listening to me right now, and, and deep in your heart you know that you wanted to accept Christ as your Savior as he was calling you, and you wanted to turn from sin and have him forgive your sin, then in the simplicity of, of that prayer and in the simplicity of faith, the Word of God says if you received him and believed in him, he gave you that power to be his child. Now, there's things to do. There's a life to live. There's great things that are going to happen in your life, and God wants to lead you through them, and you're going to need some help. If there is a Bible-believing church somewhere around you, and you'll know where that is because they talk more about Jesus than they do anything else. But uh, if, if you don't have a place like that around where you're at or you can get to, you can contact us here at Victory Church. Our web uh, address is victory-church.net. And you found us here on the Internet, so I imagine you can probably find our homepage. Just find us. Send us a note. There's a way there to contact us. You can call the church. Uh, if you're where you can get to a call or call into America, it's 972-452-3751. And you can give us a call, and we'll try to help you with the things that you need to do next. I'm so proud for you, so glad for you. If, if, if you can, come back and be with us. The next uh, simulcast, uh, the next podcast that goes out, remember that uh, all of our, our videoed messages and even a lot of our audio messages are online. Uh, you'll find them archived uh, there in the website. If there's anything we can do for you, we'll try our best to do it. God bless you. We love you. And thanks again for coming by today.